I'm doing is running from body to body, doing what I can. I do have the sense to roll the obviously dead over on their belly so that I know not to go back to them. Veterans often talk about missing the war in bewildered terms, in terms they know civilians can't really grasp, in terms they barely grasp themselves. It's about more than just the adrenaline rush or the danger, though that is a significant part of it. It's a rare opportunity to be useful, to literally save lives, to be bound to people who otherwise would be strangers by the very responsibility of keeping one another safe. Daniel Doc Buzard had been a working paramedic long before he deployed in his late 20s, but his first taste of combat medicine opened his eyes to the possibilities and meaning that providing aid has in a war zone. Meanwhile, you know, I look up in the tree where the kids were selling ice cream to those intestines hanging from the trees. What is true bravery? What makes a hero a hero? Tested by the worries of what's happening at home, thousands of miles away, and the reality of what you're facing here and now. When your life is in danger every second, and it's either kill or be killed. From Wondery and Incongruity Media, this is Anthony Russo, and this is war. There are job sites out there that will send you tons of the wrong resumes to sort through. That's not smart. But you know what is smart? Going to ZipRecruiter.com slash this is war to hire the right person. ZipRecruiter doesn't depend upon candidates finding you. It finds them for you. Its powerful matching technology scans thousands of resumes, identifies people with the right skills, education, and experience for your job, and actively invites them to apply so you get qualified candidates fast. That's why ZipRecruiter is rated number one by employers in the U.S. This rating comes from hiring sites on Trustpilot with over 1,000 reviews. And right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash thisiswar. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash thisiswar. ZipRecruiter.com slash thisiswar. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Sometimes, a calling isn't clear even after you think you've heard it. From the outside, it looked as if Daniel Buzard's calling was just to do something else, something better than whatever he already was doing. He joined the National Guard right out of high school, rose through the ranks a bit, went to airborne school, and then just dropped out. It was a different guard back in the 1990s, one that maybe didn't have the level of professionalism it would be forced to develop over the next decade. Buzard had joined with the hope of becoming a ranger, but as it turned out, the expense of the school wasn't something the National Guard was willing to cover. By 1994, Buzard had dropped out of the Guard and returned to Alaska to go to college for fire science. From there, he bounced around a little bit before ending up in paramedic school in Jefferson City, Missouri. I was coming off of work on an ambulance in Missouri that morning, and my relief that day was my actually my paramedic instructor. And she was cool because we did shift change at like 6 a.m. And I'd been out all night running calls. And she was the one that would just take over the shift but let me sleep. So I wake up around, I don't know, 7, 30, 8 o'clock in the morning. I walk out, and it's her and her partner. And I just, you know, hey, guys, what's up? And her partner looks at me and he goes, dude, shut the fuck up. And he points at the TV. And the first tower is on fire. And I look, and the second plane hits. Part of him wanted to drop everything and just go there, as much for the potential adventure as for the opportunity for retaliation. But the reality was he was already approaching 30. He had a wife and a job and wasn't even sure if he was still welcome in the army after dropping out of the National Guard. But by 2003, Buzard found himself living in New Mexico and fighting a restlessness and slogging through a failing marriage. All of a sudden, 29 didn't seem too old to be joining the army. Plus, as a paramedic, he figured he already was as well-trained as he needed to be to work as a medic in the infantry. He cut a deal that would let him re-enlist without penalty and prepare to deploy to Iraq. 
I started asking around in the guard units and stuff, is anybody slated to go? And they said, yeah, we're standing up this um, MP company and we need medics. An average army line medic is an EMT basic, whereas paramedics have a lot more anatomy and physiology. And I had a few years worth of experience in some big cities. I'd run a lot of calls. I had years of experience from Alaska and stuff culminating all up into this. I'm already significantly older than most of the people in the unit. There were very few, maybe 10 out of 180 people that had any frame of reference for combat experience. I didn't have the combat experience. I had the medical, but it was a completely different treatment type. You know, if I go to a multi-car crash, I get on my radio and I call for more help. And more ambulances show up with more people and more resources. And it's very easy. But then I'm in a war zone. And it's me and me alone. And I've got to, you know, care for all of these guys. And more often than not, as luck would have it, it turned out that I ended up working on the locals significantly more than I worked on our own guys. It would be another 18 months before he was on his way to Iraq, though. In the meanwhile, it was training on weekends and getting things in order for his deployment. He still was running calls in Los Alamos, fighting the occasional house fire and responding to accidents and other emergencies. Truth be told, Buzard liked the assignments. The thrill of running a call, of coordinating care at a multi-car pileup. He had a taste for that adrenaline rush that he really thought would serve him well in combat. By the time he boarded a flight to Kuwait on March 5, 2005, Daniel Buzard was ready to test his mettle. But the first death he had to deal with actually happened stateside. I'm sitting on the tarmac. I've got my phone. We're just waiting for the word to load on the plane. And I'm calling everybody in my phone. And I'm talking to everybody because I don't know what I'm walking into. I may not come back. I'm watching the news. You know, I know what's going on. And there's a fair chance that I'm going to die. And I get to my brother Monty's name, and I skipped over him because I said, man, if I call him, he's going to want to talk to me for like 30 minutes. I'm trying to give everybody two minutes, and I didn't call him. Well, somewhere over the Atlantic Ocean, I presume, while I was flying over there, my brother shot himself that night. By the time word reached him, Buzard and the rest of the MP unit already were on their first mission, delivering Humvees from the base in Kuwait to another one where they could be up-armored. Buzard had grown up in what we've come to call a blended family. Of his father's eight children, Monty was the one he had most grown up with. He had to say goodbye to his brother and then to his family for a second time before making his way to Baghdad and catching up with the MPs. He got to the base just as the left-seat, right-seat training was coming to an end. I remember the first patrol that I went on, we were running our show and they're telling us, you know, how to do it. And I remember I showed up for patrol. I'm going to be the only doc going out. And I show up with my pants unbloused and basically, okay, I'm not in a garrison environment. There's, we can relax a little bit. And this West Point ring tapping lieutenant starts tearing my ass up. Oh, you think we just throw all the standards out the window just because you're in combat, et cetera? And I'm like, immediately have a disdain for the active duty. Granted, their opinion of the National Guard was earned by the National Guard for having subpar performances. Now, that changed drastically over the next eight years. Remember, especially during the earliest years of the war in Iraq, Many of the National Guard members were not only not prepared to be sent to war, but also weren't training at the levels that everyday soldiers were. Once it was clear that the war in Iraq was going to be this long, drawn-out affair, the National Guard started being used as a stopgap measure. By 2005, the Army also had lowered its enlistment standards to meet the demands of the war. As relieving forces, taking the place of regular army, many of whom already had had a few combat tours and all of whom were on the verge of finishing one, there was suspicion that the guard wouldn't be able to cut it, and that any gains the army might have had might not be sustained. But it would only take a few weeks before the National Guard MPs got to show that they were both ready and able to take care of themselves as well as the people that they were there to support. We were at an Iraqi police station. It must have been... Somewhere around May, I think, of 05. So I got a couple months in. I'm starting to get my feet underneath me. 
I haven't really treated much. And we hear an explosion, and it's close. So we hop in our trucks, and we drive under this underpass. I'm, in the, I'm always in the middle truck. As the lead truck comes out, he slams on the brakes. We have to take evasive action to not run into the truck in front of us and go around. And as we kind of ed- edge up the hill, all I see across four lanes of traffic with a big median are bodies strung all across the street. And I was like, holy shit, where do I start? You know, my civilian side says, call in the cavalry, call every available medic and truck, but that isn't an option. It's me. And I'm it. And I have just a sea of dead and dismembered people laying across many lanes of traffic. In 2005, the plan for rebuilding Iraq seemed simple enough. Recruit and train an army and police force that could help stabilize the country and then protect it on its own. The difficulty was, though, that in 2004 the war had changed. First, with the capture of Saddam Hussein and most of his upper echelon, there was something of a power vacuum bringing in fighters from neighboring countries and inspiring insurgents already in Iraq. Second, as the American and coalition presence began to look more like an occupying force and less like a liberating one, Iraqis who had been pro-American, or at least not anti-American, began to falter. As he looked out over the sea of bodies of the dead, dying, and injured, a detail caught his eye, and, in a flash, Buzard had a sense of the scene. There was a great big group of men trying to join the Iraqi army because nobody had jobs because we had turned their entire country upside down. That was the only job. And all these men are lining up in, not lining up because they refuse to stand in a line, they just conglomerate around trying to get in to where they're taking applicants. And baking in the sun around noon, one o'clock, a group of them decide that, well, we're not going to stand in this group. There's some kids selling ice cream across the street, which was right near a playground. The carnage at the playground was at the outer edge of the kill zone, and its implications weren't lost on Buzard as he turned to the rest of the casualties. Lots of times we picture mass casualties cinematically, using our closest touch tone to try and get a sense of what was going on. It was what Buzard had done before encountering his first. But, as he says, even the grittiest war films with the most accurate portrayals don't get at the scene. The heat and the smells, and the screaming, and the utter chaos of an uncoordinated response to a surprise attack. I start putting tourniquets on where I can, and I'm doing what I can for who I can. Meanwhile, the Iraqi police are there with a bunch of trucks, and they are quite literally grabbing anybody that's alive and loading him in the back of the truck like cordwood and tearing off to the closest hospital. All I'm doing is running from body to body, doing what I can, I do have the sense to roll the obviously dead over on their bellies so that I know not to go back to them. And these guys are pulling security. A couple of them jumped in because they were all combat lifesaver trained and they were doing what they could, just put some tourniquets on and try to get them out. And then somebody from that playground starts shooting at us. The MP unit had just three trucks with staffing appropriate for the kind of training and support they'd been doing. There were no extra dismounts, just guys to run the truck, provide suppressive fire, and to deal with crowd control. With the soldiers out trying to help the Iraqi wounded, it took longer to dispatch the attack than they would have preferred. Moreover, even though the shooting itself wasn't deadly, the soldiers drove off the attack in short order. It hampered the triage and evacuation effort. And it was a very much so a kind of a blur. I don't know how much time elapsed. I don't know how long it all took, but... When it was all done and all the bodies had been picked up and all of the extra parts that were unassociated with a particular person were collected up, I'm bloody all the way up to my elbows, all the way down the front of my pants. I'm just, I'm covered in blood. Dizzle walks up with his um, bag of hand sanitizer and a liter bottle of water and starts pouring it into my hands and basically I take a roadside bath trying to just get all of the caked on blood off of me and I reach in my pocket and grab my can of Copenhagen and put a dip in my mouth and have a great big drink of water probably the whole liter and then Desla goes yeah man so battalion wants an estimate of to how many people you treated 
And I'm like, how the fuck am I supposed to know? I, I don't... I, and then I had a, a great idea. Everybody wears sandals, and many of them were blown out of their sandals. So I could basically count up all the sandals that I can find on the ground and, you know, divide by two, and that might give me a guess. Meanwhile, you know, I look up in the tree where the kids were selling ice cream, there's intestines hanging from the trees. And there was two pair of very small sandals. I don't know where those kids went, but, you know, I'm like, uh, I don't know, 27 to 35? I, I really don't know. And that was my first introduction into the war and really l earning the title as a doc. This was the first in what would total more than five attacks in Iraq that day, May 11. At least 30 people at the police station were killed and another 35 wounded in a day that would see more than 60 overall deaths and more than 150 casualties at the height of a week of insurgent violence all around the country. Standing there amid the blood-soaked streets as the MPs recollected themselves and continued their day, Doc Buzard knew something significant had happened, but he didn't really get the full import. Mostly because of the massive loss of life, but also because of the context. Setting aside the horror of violent death and the temperature and the smells and all of those things that make the aftermath of an event like this soul-crushing, Doc Buzard had a little insight that would develop into a passion in the ensuing decade. He felt most alive treating people in desperate circumstances. You know what's not smart? Job sites that overwhelm you with tons of the wrong resumes. But you know what is smart? ZipRecruiter.com slash this is war. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't wait for candidates to find you. ZipRecruiter finds them for you. Its powerful matching technology scans thousands of resumes, identifies people with the right skills, education, and experience for your job, and actively invites them to apply. So you get qualified candidates fast. No more sorting through the wrong resumes, no more waiting for the right candidates to apply. It's no wonder that ZipRecruiter is rated number one by employers in the U.S. This rating comes from hiring sites on Trustpilot with over 1,000 reviews. And right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address. ZipRecruiter.com slash this is war. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash T-H-I-S-I-S-W-A-R. ZipRecruiter.com slash this is war. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. By the time he was deployed to Afghanistan, Buzard had been ready to go for some time. After coming back from his deployment to Iraq, everything about his job as a fireman and paramedic just kind of bored him. House fires, which used to get his adrenaline pumping, bordered on tedious. He spent all of his spare time and not an insignificant amount of money taking up first motorcycling and then skydiving. Skydiving quickly became a passion. It was quiet and it felt dangerous all at the same time. It was exciting. It allowed him to get that rush that he missed from combat until he could go back again. And he tried to go back whenever the opportunity presented itself. When we rolled out the wire, it was like a weight was lifted off of me and I was back in my environment that I knew that I was comfortable in. It was kind of a twisted comfort that now I'm back on high alert. I'm back in my environment. I'm back in my element. All right, let's do this. Adrenaline junkie isn't quite the way to put it. It wasn't the danger of combat necessarily, although that certainly was a factor. Instead, it was the effect he could have as just one person. He could save people's lives who otherwise might have died. He could look back and say that he had a particular accomplishment and rightfully be proud of it. The trouble is, though, taking that kind of pride in your work also means suffering the consequences when things go the other way. We're just getting up to speed, you know, a convoy speed as we're leaving the wire. We're not two miles away from the entrance to the gate, and the flash boom happens. I'm on the right-hand side of the truck. A V-bid has driven out and driven underneath the second truck, the engineer's truck, and 
detonated. And it picked that truck up 10 feet in the air and it pushed it over like 15 feet. And it's immediate, you know, panic and confusion. Everybody's stepping on each other. Everybody's trying, on the radios, everybody's trying to figure out what's going on. I'm just waiting for Gribbs to say, let's go. The lead truck, they think that an IED has just gone off near the convoy, so they're trying to get out of the kill box and they step on it and leave. I don't know, it was just a well-timed breach of protocol, but I key up at the precise moment where there's finally a break in the radio, and I, all I say is 427 is hit, it's mobility killed. About that time, Gribbs says, Doc, grab your shit, let's go. And I run to all the cord length that I had, and then I get pulled backwards by my head, because I've got a headset on, and I'm like, oh shit, the vehicle's on fire. The fuel tank's ruptured, and nobody's getting out of the vehicle. And I'm kind of focused on getting to these injured guys in this truck, because this is bad. I've got enough experience to know this is going to be bad. As Gribbs and Buzard move toward the truck, they can see that it's on its side. A crowd has started to gather, and there's still no movement from inside the truck, which was carrying the commander. Sergeant Gribbs takes charge of security, gathering up guys to do crowd control and directing the remaining trucks into a defensive mode. Buzard turns toward the killed MRAP and starts to get to work. The man is concussed but can find his feet and helps establish a perimeter as Buzard turns his attention to getting into the truck. I try to go in the gunner's hatch hole and my kit was too big around for me to get in the hole. So I stripped my kit off. I handed my rifle to my interpreter, John. Try to go in the hole. I can't get in far enough to be able to find out what's going on. And then I kind of have a thought, unless the whole hole is racked, the doors ought to open in the back. Well, I go to the back and the guy that was getting switched out, all of his gear was in the back of that truck. And I, I'm basically crawling over all of his gear. Now, mind you, the truck is on fire. The, all of this elapsed in about under a minute. I've got somebody in the front of the truck screaming bloody murder, losing his mind. I've got to get up there. Well, I know somebody's alive. The man who was screaming was the driver. He'd climbed up and was sitting on top of the door of the overturned truck, looking down at his friend and colleague, Alex French. French was lying motionless with his head wedged between the door and the bulkhead. The driver had checked out. The TC, Alex French, his helmet was stuck between the bulkhead and the driver's seat. As I'm cutting his clothes off, I noticed that his M9 pistol is bent in the holster. And his rifle had been positioned on the outside of his body in between him and the door. And his rifle was bent from the barrel, from the tip of the barrel to the bottom of the stock. The whole thing was just bent like a bow. And his pistol was as well, which told me that this guy has absorbed a lot of kinetic energy. He's tore up on the inside pretty bad. His eyes are glassy, agonal respirations. This is not going to go well. But I'm going to give him 110%. We get his head freed up, and basically we just kind of slither him straight out on, t on top of the gear onto a spine board. All I've got with me at this point is my point of injury kit. So I get my simple airway, and I go to stick it down his throat so that I can start breathing for him. And so I, I try the King LT, can't make it work. Try to straighten it out, try again, can't make it work. It's just I chunked it over my shoulder. Move to plan B. All I have is a scalpel and a tube to stick a hole in his neck. So... I bust that little kid out, and I go to cut a hole in his neck. I, I can't. I've never used this style scalpel before that's got a guard on it that I couldn't figure out. So I go back focusing my efforts on figuring out how to work this guard. So I figure it out. And their team medic hopped in with the QRF because it's their, it, this guy's friends. Helicopter's inbound. I've done, I've started an IV. This other medic shows up, what can I do? And I'm like, man, the airway, you know, I've got that secured. Let me finish my um, assessments and see where we're at and stuff. And the helicopter lands and we're, we're getting him loaded up on a, um, on a litter to transport him. I give him a quick little report and I knew when we were getting ready to move him that his chances of survival were very, very low. It's a long ride back to the base after a serious casualty. 
even when you only have to travel two miles. Longer still is the time between when you hang up your gear for the day and the next mission. On mission, there's really nothing to consider. You do your job, you be there for your guys, stay vigilant and stay safe. In the quiet of the aftermath though, keeping your mind clear is a much less simple prospect. You know, we kind of roll in the roll in the gate and everybody's looking at us because we're the guys that were just outside the wire that got hit with a V-bid. I got to drop all my kit, wash myself off, and Gribs, the team sergeant says, you know, get some food, whatever. He goes, just take the afternoon, do whatever you want. And I said, I I'm going to go to the gym for a little while. I'm going to go try to work this out in my head. And he was like, all right, cool, whatever. And I don't know, an hour later, he comes and finds me at the gym, and I'm just trying to pound out my emotions. Gribs stops me, and he said, Sergeant French died as a result of his injuries. And I kind of choked it down. I mean, I didn't know this guy well. Uh, I mean, I just really just met him. He was just part of our brigade, and we were doing a joint mission. And I gave it 110%. But I don't think that even if the guy were to be hit like that and immediately magically put into a surgical suite that he would have been able to survive that kind of hit. I mean, it was a Toyota Camry station wagon with about 800 pounds of explosives in it. And it picked up a 35,000 pound truck and put it 10 feet in the air and blew it over 15 feet. You know, it bent his rifle and his pistol. That's a pretty big hit. But we, we take it personally. Even though we you know, train, they can't all be saved. And that's probably the hardest pill to swallow for the job. Broadly speaking, with the exception of mortar attacks, the barracks tended to be markedly safer than being out on patrol. But in Afghanistan, where green on blue attacks started getting a little bit more prevalent, there always was some tension on mixed bases. The soldiers did their best to shake it off. After all, it just is impossible to stay vigilant all the time. I was on the phone with my, if you will, my surrogate mom and neighbor from New Mexico. Now, whoever allowed this is. Uh, I don't know, were a couple of uh, Afghan leadership. And their soldiers would, would go in and, and talk to the major or whoever. So seeing an Afghan, you know, go into our hooch where the bulk of our guys were wasn't really out of the norm. There's no moon, the generator's off, and I'm standing outside talking on the satellite phone. I hear our feral dogs that we'd adopted all the dogs were barking, which these dogs didn't bark, and they were attacking this Afghan, which really didn't even raise a flag because the Afghans were always throwing rocks at the dogs. So it had been raining, it was muddy out, and he's got all of his kit on. I'm 50 yards, 75 yards away from him, and I'm watching him, and I'm watching all of my dogs, or all of our dogs, attacking this guy, and I'm like kind of chuckling just I, while I was talking. And boom! The rapid-fire thoughts were... Holy shit, a mortar just landed where that guy was standing. And then the rational thought was, wait, they have a hard enough time just hitting the cop in the first place. What else could cause that? <gasps> that motherfucker blew himself up. I run to my tent, throw my sat phone on the bed, grab my aid bag, and I proceed down the west side of the building. And there's like this dusty haze all down the hallway. Everybody's yelling and freaking out. If there's an upside to an attack like this, it's that there are medical facilities right nearby. Seeing that the evacuation from the scene already had begun, Buzard grabbed up two of the walking wounded and limped them down to the first aid station where he began doing triage. Remember though, this is a FOB, not a proper base. Helicopters were already inbound to take the seriously wounded on for critical care. I'm giving everybody a you know, quick little once-over triage and I'm setting them down on a bench. I'll deal with you in a minute. A minute or two later, as I'm weeding my way through, they bring in the headquarters platoon sergeant, Gary Ware, on the litter, unconscious, unresponsive, 
on his back, his right eye's hanging out of his head, and his jaw is, is locked shut. It's called trismus. Um, usually, and it, it's an indicator of a, a brainstem injury or a brain injury. He doesn't have any limbs missing. I'm, I start an IV. I'm doing an assessment. I'm, you know, I'm running through this just at light speed. And so I got to control this guy's airway. He's not leaking. He's not bleeding to death. But I got to get his airway under control really quick. And with his jaw locked shut, so to speak, I got two choices. Cut a hole in his neck, which I had just done, I don't know, two or three months earlier on a different SIG act. And I got the IV going. I got this other fireman bagging, breathing for him. And I've got the correct doses drawn up. I've got syringes in both hands as I'm, you know, taking two steps across to the litter uh, to grab the IV port. Gary sits up with his right eye hanging out of his head. I mean, he's gone from completely unconscious to sitting straight up, confused. And he kind of looks around with his good eye and his right eye's dangling. And he kind of looks around and he goes, that motherfucker blew me up. I'm thirsty. And he's got all sorts of little itty bitty holes all down his torso in the front of him. And I think I remember like a piece of his calf was missing. Um, he has taken the brunt of this explosion. Ware had seen the bomber coming and was suspicious. As he opened the door to check on the would-be assassin, the bomber had to make way for it and detonated, focusing the blast at the wall instead of down the hallway. Had the bomber made it into the barracks, there would have been a lot more damage than there was. Instead, some guys got sent home with injuries, but they did get sent home. Even Sergeant Ware. Buzard used a Sharpie marker and he wrote right on the patient what was done and what still needed to be done before loading him up and sending him off on a helicopter. Later, he would discover that the surgeon used those notes to save Ware's life and even was able to save his eye. I don't like to know the details of my critical patients after the fact. I have a hard time processing those things. I know that I did everything that I could. I've never reserved any effort in keeping an American soldier alive, ever. And I'm proud of that. But I do carry with me the, the ones that I gave 110% to that no matter what in my conscious brain i know that they might not have they would not have survived despite my 110% but as my team sergeant sergeant gribbins once said or said after alex french got killed in uh i know you're going to take this personally and you can't but sergeant french died as a result of his injuries well sergeant ware didn't Because most of us will never be in a primitive place with only primitive care, it's really hard to get a sense of just what a combat medic does and sees. Day-to-day -day flesh wounds, sprained ankles, and all kinds of minor injuries piled in right along with traumatic ones can alter your perception. Not that it reduces your response or your level of care, quite the opposite, but it can mute your personal response until after the fact. By the time he was done with his third combat tour, Buzard was angling for a spot as a flight medic, mostly because of his battlefield experiences, but also because of his mass casualty skills. He relished the chaotic assignment of being able to fly into a combat zone, pick up the seriously wounded, and keep them alive between the battlefield and the operating table. It was something he felt was right up his alley. But now I'm in a position that is very much exactly what I wanted. I have now been given the opportunity to do the most good for the most people in the best position, I think, for me. Because that's all I ever wanted to do was help people out that were sick and injured and get them back to their families. They were outbound to pick up some guys who were concussed after an MRAP explosion when they got redirected. One of the EOD guys cleaning up the scene of the explosion had stepped on an IED. He was critical. There's no moon. The gunship escort was firing infrared rockets. They'd fire a rocket and, you know, from a distance and it would burst over our heads and it would burn an infrared something so that we could see because we had night vision goggles on. 
And I remember landing in this dry riverbed and seeing an MRAP off to the um, side. And I exit the left side of the aircraft and I'm walking out of the rotor disc and I'm waving because I'm told that this guy is a triple amputee. I'm waving the crew, the litter crew in underneath the rotor disc and they slide him in on the deck of the aircraft. I remember the canister that the 64s had just fired had burned out right as they were approaching the rotor disc. So it's like turning off a floodlight and then the next canister opens up and in that blink of delay, as this guy goes by me, the new canister opens up and I get a good look at him and he's fucked up bad. He's missing both of his hands, his right arm, his radius, the, one of the bones is exposed. There's no muscle. It's burnt. It looks like a bone claw from one of the Wolverine movies. Prompted would get up in my lap and just lick the tears off my face. And we've just got that connection. He's mine and I'm his. And, you know, it's not really a joke when a working dog has a sign on his vest, whatever says, do not separate from handler. You can't separate him from me. I am his, I am his responsibility, and he takes his job very seriously. The thrill of the fight might have brought Doc Buzard to the army, but his unconditional will to help, to provide what aid, or at least to bring what comfort he could, developed in pace with any desire to be in the thick of things. And when you think about it, they're kind of the same. To fight death at the margins with only the smallest satisfaction from success and tons of regret from failure, Knowing that the winning is in the doing, and having given your all, sometimes is enough to get you by. Next time on This Is War. A rocket-propelled grenade hit this tree, essentially exploded, and I was in the fireball. You know, like, I remember just there was this white flash and this incredible heat. Are you a combat veteran, or do you know one with a story to tell? Reach out to us at stories at thisiswar.com with your dates and branch of service, as well as a brief description of the experience that you would like to share. If you like the show, you can help support us by visiting our sponsors or by leaving a five-star review wherever you're listening right now. This Is War was written by me, Anthony Russo, and produced by Incongruity Media. Executive producer, Hernan Lopez for Wondery. 